Okay, welcome everyone. I'm Susan Vonderhaar down here in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I see at least one other Cincinnatian here, Janet. And um, I just, this is the fourth community conversation. Is that true of the Ohio Community Rights Network? And tonight we welcome Tish O'Neill, uh, sorry, Tish O'Dell from uh, the Cleveland area who is gonna be talking about this alternative movement um, because after so long, we come to realize that the old ways just really aren't going to work for us. And how do we build a new world, what we really want? So this is the sort of thing um, we're looking toward. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to a film. Right, Susie? Unfortunately, I don't know what the film is or I would introduce it. I'm sorry. It's the truth and reckoning that we did send out in the invite emails. It's it's 10 minutes long. For several years, Mocha has been working with internationally known and recognized artist Andrea Bowers, Tish uh, from Salda and various partners to develop a multimedia project called Exist, Flourish, and Evolve that asks us to consider how we can better protect and support Lake Erie. So we brainstormed some more and realized that what we needed was to first get people to be honest about this culture and the current system we have all been born into and reckon with our place in it before we can even begin to discuss solutions on how we get into right relationship with nature and with each other. And if laws and policy are to reflect the values of a community or culture, then a cultural shift has to happen to push those laws and policies. And I often pose this as a what comes first question to people. Do the laws change culture or does culture change the law? It is incredible to me that in recent decades, it was even possible to pollute such a large body of water to the point that we could not swim in it or drink it, and that the life within was threatened by our actions, and more importantly, by our inactions. In previous summers, my friends and I would go to Presque Isle every other week. This summer, we only went once, because the anxiety of contracting some sort of ailment from going in the water is so high. Laws must be changed to respect and acknowledge the interconnectedness of all life and nature. Do companies have a right to amass as much wealth and power as possible, regardless of how it harms our health? Do they have rights to all the land, water, and air of Mother Earth? Do they have the right to destroy it to the extent that we can no longer survive in our common home? Do we blindly follow unregulated capitalism to such an extreme that we sit by idly and watch it cause our own extinction? We must answer each of these questions with a resounding no, given that human rights and the rights of nature are far more important than the alleged rights of destructive, self-serving corporations. I just could not get over how uncompromising like the testimonies and opinions of people were on this subject of the rights of Lake Erie. But I was really happy to see like I said, just the uncompromising restatement that the, the lake needs to be saved. And the lake is really just a microcosm of the planet. I, don't, I honestly think that um, the happiness that I have, which is fleeting and not often, because a lot of you people in this room know this work is hard. It does not get back easily. Um, but to to know 
that an organization like CELDAP has done so much for my community. They've done everything. They've saved it. I love you guys. We owe everything to you. Looking back, I've come full circle as that young activist, still waiting for the first Earth Day, a true Earth Day that holds the new vision that we need, one that we're bringing into focus here today. That vision is beyond science, it's beyond policy, it's beyond government. It gets to the heart and soul of the issue, which is to correct the perverse and abusive relationship we have had with the natural world for far too long. I do not doubt that to recognize your participation within the context of colonization is uncomfortable. Yet to invite the truth is to honor the truth. And at its heart, the DOD, which is sometimes called the DOD history, is the power and influence of the Catholic Church in the 15th and 16th centuries. Three papal bulls that are not even considered official church teaching gave license for nations in the New World to take control over both people and land. People's dignity, their land, rights, and freedom were taken away. And today, he felt it within my heart. I could see it within the people that I spoke with um, and the testimonies that came out, mainly from the youth um, that was in our group and what they had to say and how they connected with nature. Um, I think we're on the right path. And it's one I'd like to continue. So this idea of truth is that our current system of which we're all a part of is not working. And the frustration we feel that it is not working is a shared experience as we've heard today. But the system was not designed to benefit us and most especially not designed to benefit Mother Earth. I think the state of our climate is now in disrepair. For this reason, my future as I grow older will look very different from my parents and grandparents. It will definitely affect my decision on whether or not to have children. I, I, I am complicit. I have taken that deal in some ways. Um, and however much I devote myself to a cause or to a creed or um, to community action, I'm guilty and I feel guilty. Can we admit that it is the diseases of greed, colonial capitalism, self-centeredness, intolerance, arrogance, and supremacist thinking, among many other things, that have put humankind and all of our relatives, all other living beings we share this time and space with, at risk of not only death, but extinction in this space? Biophilia means the love of life, of all life. Law must protect seagulls and summer rain, blue herons and blue gill, bugs, butterflies, and songbirds, rivers, forests, grasslands, the Great Lakes, and all the human children who depend on them. Anything less is simply suicidal. The people here, even though we're a small group, will carry the message just like the tributaries of the Great Lakes. And that this message, you know, will get out there and we can do this. I really want to emphasize that we're here to, to see this out with our with our heart. And that's what's going to win out in the end. How have managed to contact people from not only all over the Great Lakes, but from fields that are outside of what you would think of as a traditional realm of ecology and environmentalism. And so it's kind of just here as a reminder of uh, uh, how many people are really invested in doing what the know needs to happen. MOCA is working with Andrea Bowers and CELDEF on a project intended to bring awareness and action to the challenges facing Lake Erie. This is an earlier work by Andrea called, uh, focused on the rights of nature 
and gives a sense of Andrea's neon artwork. Our new multi-part project entitled Exist, Flourish, Evolve is an artistic campaign to buttress the work of CELDEF and other organizations that are working to establish rights for ecosystems and human rights to water and to ban detrimental practices, including fracking, factory farming, sewage sludging of farmland and water privatization. The project combines Andrea's longstanding advocacy for environmental justice with her personal history being raised in uh, Northeast Ohio on Lake Erie. If we're truly going to stop the destruction and return human cultures to right relationship with the natural world, we must change our legal system from one that objectifies nature to one that recognizes that the needs of the natural world are primary, that the health of the Great Lakes is more important than the health of the economy, and that in killing our relatives in the natural world, we are killing ourselves. Wow. Thank you. Thanks for showing that. So I haven't watched that in a long time. I forgot how powerful it was. I mm -hmm. forgot. Yeah. I can't believe I forgot. <laughs> but for those of you who aren't aware, um, there's this art show going on. It's only going on. If you can't get to Cleveland before Sunday, you won't get to see it. Um, it's closing Sunday, but um, it's what prompted us to do this event. And a lot of you on the call were at part one. Some of you were at part one and part two, which just happened last month. So um, for those of you who haven't, you can watch all the testimonies in full on the YouTube, um, Seldef YouTube site. There's a playlist for all those. And we're gonna start putting out videos hopefully soon from part two, which was the right relationship part of the event. So you'll be able to view all those things. Many of you, you know, tonight know me and you know a lot about my journey and that it started in Rights of Nature way back in 2010 and 2011 when I discovered the urban drilling and fracking happening in my sleepy suburban community of Broadview Heights, Ohio. A lot of you guys on the call I know that are part of Ohio Community Rights Network you started about that same time. And with every new truth, and I put truth in quotes, right, that I discovered along my journey about our system of law and about our democracy by the people, I didn't call them truths at the time. It was more like a horror show for me. <laughs> and the more I learned, um, the more it angered me and also, you know, scared me, I guess, like a real horror show when thinking about my son's future and the future in general. It also made me more determined. Um, that I wanted to do what I could to help change the system, to be more in line with my values and sense just of what I thought was right, the right thing to do. And so just really quickly, some of the truths I discovered along my path and journey were that one, we live under an illusion of democracy, that the wealthiest among us contributed to candidates in both parties. And so they basically bought our electeds. I remember when I first found that out, I was totally shocked. I looked at like campaign records for Cuyahoga County in Cleveland, and I couldn't believe that these people were giving to both campaigns, both the Democratic candidate and the Republican. That's how naive I was at that time. But then once they bought those electeds, they could, you know, hand legislation and regulations to our electeds. And so in reality, they were writing the laws that we were all subject to. Another truth along the way was that the regulatory and protection agencies I thought were actually there to protect us, and that that was really a mirage of sorts, that they actually permitted and legalized the very harms, poisons, and toxins that people in the community, including me, wanted to stop. And also that corporate actors, including many large NGOs with protective sounding names and many of whom I had donated to along the way, were actually part of something called disaster capitalism. And in a perverse way, they were benefiting from the disasters that happened. And at times it was overwhelming and I really just wanted to quit and go back to my life before I learned all these truths. But that's when I realized I couldn't unknow the truths I discovered along my journey. 
So now almost 15 years later, I'm still reckoning every day with these truths. And almost every day I'm thinking about ways I can help to get into more right relationship with both nature and the other humans that I interact with. I've also had to learn that my journey and experiences are not the same as other people's. And that's been a big part of my evolution. And many of you on this call, you knew me back in my early activist years, and you maybe didn't even like me very much back then for my truth telling. Um, but it's been a part of my evolution and growth to recognize that those are my truths and that they may not be the same for everyone else. You know, my personal goal is to continue learning and evolving with each day. And this earth I inhabit is such an amazing place. And I have to take the time to notice that every day. So like on Sunday, I was weeding a little bit and I saw something move to my right. I was like, you know, down on my knees and I saw like, what's moving over there? And I moved a branch. It was between my thyme and mint. And there was just a new butterfly there. It was beautiful. And it was like drying its wings and flapping them. And I watched for almost 20 minutes and then it flew to the grass and then it went to a magnolia bush and I followed it, you know, as it went from place to place. And it brought me a lot of joy, but I also felt really protective of that butterfly. <laughs> like I did nothing, but all of a sudden, because I like discovered it and then I watched it go, you know, I was like, oh, my little butterfly, you know, and I still wonder like today, I'm like, what happened to her? So, you know, again, this is just me, my personal stories and truths, but meeting Andrea Bowers and all the people at the Museum of Contemporary Art and that were involved in the rights of nature art exhibit, they changed my life literally again, and they changed it for the better and helped me evolve in my thinking about art as part of movement building. But at the same time, I also had to recognize that so did the drilling companies like Cutter Oil, Ohio Valley Energy, and yes, even Duck Creek Energy that got me started on this path. And I don't know, some of you might remember, I remember Rhonda Rita, I don't know how many of you remember her, she was with the Oil and Gas Association, and how she tried to shame me at a community meeting by questioning me and saying, well, don't you heat your home with gas? And didn't you get here in a car? You know, and all these, and I was like, at the time, like, well, yeah, you know, cowering, and it's like, but how that all helped shape, you know, it was one of the experiences that led me on this path and journey. And I think of all the lawsuits that we filed over the years and all the decisions that came out against people in nature. And then I think of all these encounters when I'm struggling and contemplating each day, what would a healthy, sustainable community where the humans within the community are in right relationship with nature and each other really look like? So these are the kind of conversations and questions that I have with myself in my head. <laughs> But I also have them with other people sometimes too. And I hope that it's like something we can talk about and have a conversation tonight about. And just to get everyone on the same page, because I do see some people I don't know. So I thought what I would do is just show a quick, there's a few um, slides I put together um, actually for a presentation that I did on Monday. And I thought we'd start here so that we're all kind of maybe starting at the same place. Um, just at least for this conversation. I know we're not starting at the same place. Oh, let's see. I forgot how to do this part too. I have to get it full screen. Hold on. Oh, there, there we go. Oh, now that bar's in my way. Hold on. Okay. From the slide show. There we go. <laughs> okay. Can y'all see it now? All right, and we'll do that. Okay. So I just felt like, you know, this tight, you know, like a truth and reckoning with nature, isn't it time, Ohio? It's like, oh my gosh, so we've been through so much and we see so much destruction going on here. So I, I really like, feel like it is time to have this conversation. So the first thing I just want to like, so maybe we all have a different idea of what rights of nature are. So this is a definition that we put together at CELDEF, and I, I really liked it for this because 
and I highlighted the parts I like. So it means securing the highest legal protection and the highest societal value for nature through the recognition of nature's rights and associated human rights. And I feel like CELDEF in the last 25 years, we focus so much on the highest legal protection part of this definition. And now we kind of are pivoting and thinking, you know what, we kind of ignored the highest societal value part, because as we know, things wound up in the courts, the legal system, and it was kind of turning it over to them to make the decisions and like they somehow have the authority to decide what's best for all of us. And rights of nature, many of you already know this, but I thought maybe good review. And for people who are new, it's a new legal framework rooted in indigenous knowledge and new scientific understanding of our interconnectedness with nature. Humans are part of nature, not above it. We seek rights and rights of nature seeks responsibility and stewardship, not ownership. Nature has a right to exist, flourish and thrive in its own right, not dependent on human rights and human economic gains. And that, that's a huge one. That's a huge shift. I think that, you know, culturally and in our values, we have to come to terms with. And it also rights of nature gives legal standing to nature and provides residents living within that ecosystem or watershed with a legal tool to not only hold polluters accountable after the harm, but to object to the harm before it happens. We're talking about a movement, not a moment. Um, again, that our laws should be a reflection of our values. And when those values change, our laws should change. And so that's, I think, what we have to you know, think about when we're working on some of this stuff in our communities. Change is born from confrontation and social movements through history have been won over decades, not just one election, one initiative, one moment, but movements take longer. And I know everyone then gets very, um, here's where I get a lot of pushback, you know, but, oh, we don't have a lot of time and, you know, we have to move faster and all that. And I, you know, but when we focus on that, what I've realized is when we're in panic mode, we don't necessarily make the best decisions. <laughs> And so we need to kind of step back from that and I th think more about the strategy and what our actions are and not be in that panic mode because the other side is never in panic mode. And rights of nature and community rights dismantles injustice from the grassroots up. And then I added this just last week because I said, you know, we really need to be honest and truthful in order to create a movement for change. And I think that's a big problem that we've had too. Um, we start from a different place, a place of the existing system, which already is not the right place probably we should be starting because we're looking at the regulatory system and we're starting from, well, what's the best we can get? And it can't just be about regulating harms and bad behavior. We know that because we're living with the consequences of that kind of a system. It can't just be about econ our economics, right? It has to be about more. Not saying, and again, not saying that we shouldn't consider it at all. That isn't what I'm saying, but that it can't just be about that, which so much of our current system and the laws are all about that and only that. And it can't just be about creating awareness. And again, not that creating awareness isn't a good thing. It is, but you can see from the photo that when we only create awareness and nothing else, 50, 60, 70 years go by and we're still creating awareness that pollution is a dirty shame. And it can't just be about the law as it is, right? Because the law as it is sees nature as property. And I just love this Aldo Leopold quote, so I like to read it out loud. He says, we abuse land because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us. And when we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. And we also have to shift a little bit in our thinking that this is a community too. We always think of communities with humans as part of them. And of course, humans are part of the community, but this is also a community even though there are no humans in that photo. And this is a community. So, you know, this is where we got to the truth reckoning and right relationship with the Great Lakes. And if you haven't 
been this is staying up this isn't coming down just so you know so this is on the back of the science center in cleveland and so starting to think about these are actually the the words the legal words from the lake erie bill of rights and andrea had a way of turning them into something beautiful but it also obviously is now everyone who comes this will be up all summer um and that's very crowded location behind the science center and the rock hall and everyone who sees this is hopefully going to read these words and that it might get them to start thinking, what does that mean? Um, this is going to stay up also, even though the rest of the exhibit's coming down. It's the Great Lakes Bill of Rights. And this is actually part of the legal language from the Great Lakes Bill of Rights that's introduced by a New York legislator. And it's currently in the New York legislature um, as an introduced bill. But it says that the Great Lakes ecosystem possesses the inalienable and fundamental rights not to be owned, privatized, or monetized. And you can see this, even though the museum is dark and you can't see in the museum, this is in a place where it's lit up and at night, it really shines. And you can see how large it is by that person standing next to it on the right there. <laughs> it's big. It's big and bold. And just to give you a few, you know, quotes that came out of the, the truth part, the truth and reckoning, the testimonies we did in um, October, I picked a few because they're just really powerful. And I want the rest of us to, you know, the rest of the conversation tonight, really, for us to be honest and truthful if we can um, in our conversation. And it's hard. Um but Sundance made this statement. He said, ask yourself what your connection is to the natural world and how to establish a connection. What does it mean to have a connection to the natural world? Is it simply, I own this land? And Susan, who's on the call, she made a lot of profound statements in her own testimony that day. I don't know if you want to read it, Susan, or you want me to read it? Well, what I came to realize is today what I find perplexing is how difficult it is for me to explain the regulatory fallacy to people who are currently employed in agents of gover agencies of government, non-governmental organizations, would-be do-gooder, environmental activists who do not understand that they're on a hamster wheel playing a game of whack-a-mole to try to use subversive regulatory policy that intentionally prevents genuine environmental protection. It's something that took me so long to come to understand what is wrong? Why aren't the regulations working? When the fact of the matter is they're working just fine for the polluters. That's why they were written the way they are. Environmental regulations permit pollution. That's what they were intended to do. And it's really hard for people who think they're, you know, they're environmentalists and they're going to go work for, you know, natural resources departments. And they're going to just get on the hamster wheel and just keep playing this stupid game that goes nowhere. And uh, yeah, it took me, you know, studying the work of CELDEF and even teaching environmental science. When I retired from research as an environmental researcher, I started teaching environmental science part-time. And that's when I really uncovered what the real problem was. It was, you know, I was too close to it when I thought I was saving the world by doing cutting edge research. If it's not put into practice, what good is it? We don't need any more data like Tish likes to say. We've got plenty of studies. We know we need to stop the harm and respect, respect the right of the natural world to exist, thrive, and flourish unharmed. And in case people don't know, Susan worked for the Environmental Protection Agency as a contractor for 20, was it 20 years? Yeah, 2025. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, give or take a few, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the shifting, the agency shifted, the contracting organization shifted, but, and I was doing, you know, my master's thesis research in the beginning. So right. depending how you count, we can say 25. Right. But so she definitely knows it's not just someone just saying this 
based on, or even like me saying it, I mean, she was right in it. And then we had also there, um, Dr. Kirk uh, Skirdo, he's a medical doctor and also has his master's of public health. And he spoke, gave testimony and said, do companies have a right to amass as much wealth and power as possible, regardless of how it harms our health? Do they have the rights to all the land, water and air of Mother Earth? Do they have the right to destroy it to the extent that we can no longer survive in our common home? And I don't know, maybe some of you have heard of uh, Zach Bush. He's another medical doctor and he's involved in a lot of projects, Farmer's Footprint. He's into a lot of tying, obviously, human health with what we're doing to the environment and talking about industrialized ag agriculture. And I thought this was so interesting because he obviously, you know, making connections, right? And putting things together. Well, that how the industrialized agricultural practices used in conventional farming have coincided with the explosion of chronic disease, ecosystem collapse, and biodiversity loss. And then another um, physician, Dr. Rupa Myra, she wrote this great book called Inflamed. She actually is a physician in California. She also is involved in a lot of um, social justice activism. She also um, works with regenerative farming. And she's, I think, pretty sure she's internal medicine, but she's in an emergency room, or she was. Um, maybe she switched. But, you know, she talks about as the world burns, your body is inflamed, your body is part of a society inflamed, and as a consequence, the planet is inflamed. And I loved the connections that she makes to all of that. So, I mean, together, I really do believe we can build the movement to make sustainability legal and leave future generations with healthy, livable, just communities. If those are the values that we believe in, it's up to us, right, to make those real. And so the question always is, does the law change culture or does cultural shifts change the law? So with that, I'm going to stop sharing. So that's just to give us a little... Um, <laughs> food for thought to start our conversations tonight. And so I don't know um, if any of you have something you want to just share based on, you know, what I've said so far, what you saw in the Truth and Reckoning um, highlight video, you know, or I mean, I had one of the questions that I wanted to, some questions that I wanted to pose and you can feel free to like answer those or start a conversation. But you know, our current cultural societal norms, which are reflected both in our laws and policies, separate humans from the natural world and nature. And I was curious if you guys can think of any examples of that in your own communities or maybe some, pro you know, things you're working on or that you know about. And then another one I like to ask people is what's your relationship with a body of water in your community or maybe with an ecosystem in your community? Because we're from all over um, Ohio, I can see based on the names, you know, and would you say you're in right relationship or not? Or how could you be in better relationship? Anyone have any uh, thoughts, comments, questions? You can certainly just speak up or raise a hand and you'll go up to the upper left. <laughs> so I'm putting in the chat the questions you asked, or I'm trying to. We got, do laws change culture or does culture change laws? Does anybody have any thoughts on that? What's coming first here, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> yes, Bob. I would say I'm really appalled at the state government um, uh, trying to take over state parks and public lands for fracking purposes. Uh, it's really an abhorrent kind of activity that what has been set aside uh, for human enjoyment and refreshment is being used for this uh, really pretty disastrous enterprise. Uh, it's it's really a, a sad scene and, you know, it's something to be resisted. I want to add that in 2013, there were many protests and rallies and people talking to our state legislature, and we actually thought that they weren't going to 
frack in the parks. But then, you know, administrations change, more money pours in, you know, yeah. So just a little side note there. I'm gonna, can I add something here, Bob? And you know, again, oh. sorry. Susan, did you wanna say something? No. Okay. Um, no, Bob, to your, and again, you know, I mean, I'm totally with you. I think it is awful that they want to frack in the park. So that's not, but I just, again, we're all about trying to shift our perspectives, I think. And it's another thing that I've had to try and shift, but this idea of, you know, nature, rights of nature, um, and it's our lack of understanding, I think, about Nature and I it's funny this past weekend I had with family members um conversations about this too. Someone who lives in a location, one of my cousins, um, not in this country, and we were talking about food and organic food, I think, and she made the comment, well, the country she lives in has much stricter regulations um and protections on their agriculture. And so her food is much, much cleaner. And I said, Well, it may be cleaner. I said, but you understand that if the country next to you is not, has this, doesn't have the same regulations, that nature doesn't recognize these boundaries and borders that you and your head are creating for yourself. It makes you feel good. I mean, it makes me feel good too and a bit safer, right? But it doesn't work that way. So the air that is in the polluted country that's allowing the pollution is still coming your way. And if it rains, it's still coming down on your food. And if there's things being injected underground or put into a stream or a river that is in the polluted country and it comes through your country, it all still affects it. You know, so again, it's in our minds that, you know, this kind of elude these illusions that we have. And so when it comes to the parks, and I can remember way back when in in Broadview Heights, talking to Nikki Antonio at the time about it. She was state rep at the time. And I said, if this is too dangerous to do in the parks, isn't it too dangerous to do in my backyard? You know, I like, I didn't quite understand the logic there. And so this idea that, you know, if we stop them and put all this energy into not fracking the park, but we let them frack next to the park, out this cre this weird boundary that we've created, right, where the park starts and ends. So nature starts in the park, but ends outside it, that if there's pollution from that fracking outside the park, it's going to go into the park anyway and harm it. So, you know, and a, a lot of this came about when I started, you know, thinking about the forest fires, right, in Canada, and we're getting air quality alerts here in Cleveland. And so trying in our own minds to think about that, that and so many of us, we believe it because it's what we've been taught for so long that, you know, and I know, Sherry, you've had this with the GMO salmon, you know, being raised in a land based farm in your community, but that they're going to dispose of the waste into the Maumee River and St. Joe's, which could get into Lake Erie. And so then that GMO fish is now in Lake Erie, and it's not going to stop. It doesn't know the boundary from Lake Erie to Lake Ontario, you know, to Niagara River, to the St. Lawrence. Um, so yeah, this idea of protection based on false jurisdictions that we create, <laughs> the fake lines we draw into nature. Right. But we'd have, I mean, the parks represent something that we think is precious and we're preserving and it's like okay this is this is an, a full affront to us now if you cross that line you've gone too far and it, uh, it fracking in the park just represents something intolerable to us you, you know to many i mean it's like to me it's like like why do you get a more severe sentence if you hurt a police officer than if you hurt a regular citizen because we hold the standard and we're trying to hold our parks up to a standard that just might spin on it. it it says that nothing is holy nothing is holy if that's not a whole if the national if a national park or state park isn't holy then nothing is holy i mean that's that's kind of what it says because we many of us on this together. Call, yeah. yeah, I was going to say many of us on this call, I think, know that, you know, because it should be our communities, too. I mean, we're all 
the nature, all of us in our communities have been poisoned and things like that too. Yeah, so it's interesting. But it's interesting that people are <clears throat> up in arms about the fracking in the parks, which I agree shouldn't be done, but there's not enough of them that care about fracking on people's property or pipelines within 50 feet of a person's bedroom window, unless it's on their property, if it's on other people's property or other people's communities, then it's not a big deal. But everybody is more concerned about it in the parks, which is important. But, uh, you know, <clears throat> I see a difference there. Um, I'd just like to weigh in a little bit on the water. Um, I'm way up in far <clears throat> northwest corner of Ohio. And we're totally reliant on an aquifer or groundwater. And since 2018, we've had a couple threats where um, there are ones to sell huge amounts of water to Toledo area communities, and then another, this genetically modified salmon farm. But I think the thing, I think people took for granted um, that water, it we have a lot of it and it was always gonna be there. And the interesting thing is that all of a sudden when they saw it being threatened, they began to see all these connections. Um, mm -hmm. Our area is really rural. Um, we have some unusual formations because of the glaciers that were here. And we have, we have one little kettle lake that has like 30 species of critters that exist no place else in the country. And so it was really interesting to see people begin to bring up all these things and like the connections, like if the groundwater is depleted, there's a connection, the groundwater to the surface water. And they began, not that they weren't concerned about what it would do to the humans, but and maybe it was just because they were trying to think of ways to keep this from happening. But they began to bring up all these things of the connections in nature that you didn't hear people express beforehand. Charlotte. Um, in answer to your question, I guess I would say both. It's kind of like ratcheting. You've got to have both happen at the same time. And um, as we try to increase our own awareness and get other people more aware and address things that are happening. I mean, it's what we're just celebrating, celebrating, noting um, we're right at um, the 70, 70th anniversary of uh, Brown v. Board of Education. And that it still hasn't resulted in truly equal education, though it's not what it was. So you got to have both. And I think the difficult part, too, is that even when the people may have this cultural shift that you don't see that expressed in law. I mean, in our case, they created a regulatory program in 2019, shortly after the first attempt to sell the water from the aquifer. And it really didn't contain anything at all that the people were concerned about. Um, and to me, there was, I'm not saying it was the type of shift you would like to see, but there was a shift in people's belief about the water. But it, at least in our case, the law, our legislators didn't respond to the things that people were even expressing. Have, have we ever thought about educating people who are running for state offices um, in the legislature or other offices about these issues and presenting them with some facts that they might be able to use? Who wants to take that? I know a lot of you have been involved. I'd like to take that one. <laughs> we all would like to take that one. We've been there many times. We're a little shaded, Janet. <laughs> Go ahead, Susan. Well, you know, 
I find that the elected sure, um, you know, sing a good song, right? They, they sure got the good lip service going on. And uh, I, uh, unless, you know, there are those individuals who actually run, I got a cacophony going on, sorry, you know, who run on a platform like environmental protection. Perhaps, you know, that would be an ear that would, um, would, you know, truly listen. But like Tish said in the beginning, you know, the deep pockets of industry are so prevalent. And if someone has an ambition to be, you know, a, in a political career, they're going to climb that ladder. And it's a corporate ladder. <laughs> I, you know, I, I think there's plenty of information, you know, I think it's a cultural shift that has to happen because I think it has to be an intrinsic personal value that, you know, information hasn't gotten us there. You know, we had plenty of information at the US EPA to tell people what the problems were, but it didn't change anything. And I'll stop rambling. I know I'm rambling. <laughs> well, yeah, Charlotte, this... Charlotte and then Joe. That's why we have to, as you say, uh, imperfect or not. I'm not quite sure what you said about democracy, but I hope everyone has signed the uh, petition to uh, have an independent redistricting commission because we have to push for a better democracy on all fronts if we hope to make a difference. Um, a, for all people, and then for us recognizing connection with nature. So it, gerrymandering, and if people are, and and also, as has been pointed out, who the legislature has great power and great anonymity, and who knows they have the power, the wealth, and, and big corporations. So <laughs> there's so much we need to do. I, I'd just like to say that uh, about 70% of this planet is covered with water, but only between one tenth and three tenths of one percent of that water is accessible, potable, and renewable. And the key key word there is renewable. It's if I don't care if you quote unquote own property, the water on that property is for future generations, and, and that's what people don't seem to understand. Uh, every time the Muskingum Watershed Conservancy sells a gallon of quote unquote their water, it ends up to the frackers, it ends up polluted. So it's not theirs to sell. It's for future generations if you want the renewable part. Uh, we're, li we're like a, a, a sailor in the on a watercraft in the middle of ocean dying of thirst. And, and that's how uh, the uh, mindset we have to uh, uh, treat water. It's, it's more valuable than uh, 20 years of uh, natural gas. Uh, it just, uh, the the rationale be of the, of the trade-off is ludicrous. That's all so I wanted to Peter, say. So Peter and then Russell and then Kathy. So thank you all. I'm uh, relatively new to the group. So I wanted to start with gratitude for all the actions you've taken and also for meeting Tish at MOCA for two programs. Um, my question uh, builds on the last comment about future facing, because I uh, think the greatest ally in creating change in human culture, and I agree culture goes before law, is Mother Nature. And um, Mother Nature has a document called the Rights of Humans. And um, we are um, violating many of the covenants that we have with Mother Nature, and it is going to get worse. So my future, future forming question is, where do we go when the disasters start happening with greater magnitude, whether it's the smoke or the heat this summer we're facing? By the way, I'm from Cleveland. I, I want to commend a, a book uh, that I'll end my comments with by um, Jonathan Markley um, called The Deluge. Uh, the Deluge is a 900-page cli-fi novel that basically answers in his mind the question I just asked, what happens when politics, science, ecologies get worse? And I will end by saying that it's so bad that they make the capital of the United States Cleveland. 
And I, 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 that sounds like a, a, a demeaning comment for Cleveland. I didn't mean that. But obviously, we in Ohio are in, a, are in a, an interesting position in terms of the, the weather and the geology. <clears throat> and um, what's going to happen? What, what are the actions that we're going to take when Mother Nature sends us further signals that her rights need to be, um, to be more recognized when the disasters increase in intensity? That's what I think we have to be prepared for. Thank you. I just want to, I agree with that's what kind of like the direction we're kind of, it's again, that idea of creating the sustainable communities that we envision and that we know we're going to need, right? And it's like not waiting for permission to do it and not, you know, or asking permission, I guess, to do it. Like, how are we going to start turning away from the system and to what you're saying, Peter, create, you know, what we know we need, I mean, we have all this data, like that Susan talked about, right? We have all this for years. We have tons and tons of data because they'll spend a ton of money on that. And we know what's happening. We know what's coming. And yet we're asking permission of the very people that are like, like, when are we just going to start doing it and creating it? I think, who is next? Yeah, Roger. I didn't want to discourage Russell. Janet. I'm oh. sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't want to discourage Janet from, yeah, we should educate our leaders, you bet. But when the people lead, the leaders follow. And that's history. You know, this is a social justice movement. Absolutely. I think Russell, Kathy, Russell, Kathy, go ahead. Say something. Uh, Russell, it, Russell's next and then Kathy. I, I'm keeping, a, keeping the stack. <laughs> and then Gwen, Gwen's next after that. Then. Okay, great. Russell, oh, you're on mute, you Russell. How about now? You're yep. good. Okay. Um, all right. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I'm on board. What what can I do? What can what can individuals do to do what we're talking about? I think a lot of that's going to depend on in your own community and each community is different. And so, you know, it's really funny what we started talking about is how good they are dividing us. So this divide and conquer stuff, like whether it's with, you know, electoral stuff in politics or issues, whereas instead of like finding people who are like minded, who want to create like a positive, better community instead of, so you'll find that you have more in common. So say it just uses an example. I'm not saying for your community, it's that, but say it's water, right? Like healthy, clean water. Like, where's it coming from? Like, what we all want, nobody wants their kids to be poisoned. Nobody wants to be poisoned themselves. This tying the connection between health, our health and, you know, say the water's health um, and maybe starting some conversations in your community, which, cause you're not, you're, this is the right relationship part, right? You have to be able to have relationships with people and trust before you can start actually making some of these changes that we're talking about and even taking risks, right? To butt up against the system. So, you know, that's what I would suggest starting with. And it can start with, most of us started with two people, three people, you know, so that's the thing. And they teach us that that's not doing anything, that unless we have, you know, a hundred people, a million people in the street, we're not doing anything. But I don't believe that anymore. <laughs> Kathy? Okay, Kathy. Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> you can't see me because I was out getting signatures all day today and I'm, I'm a mess. So that's why you can't see me. But um <clears throat> To the lady that said, um, have we educated our legislators who make the laws? Um, yes, we have done that so many times every year over and over to the point where I, I feel, not that I would stop necessarily, but I feel it's a waste of time. Just this past November, we um, in the different counties where um, the brine was still being spread, the radioactive brine, we went to our legislators and we took all the information with how radioactive it is. And, and we educate the new, new legislatures every year on the effects to the environment. So our particular one is up for reelection. And I said to her, you know, would you co-sign on a bill with the other side to uh, say, we can't spread this on the roads anymore. And she's, and I, and she said, well, I, 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 I won't do it. You know, have, 
have so-and-so in Kishakton, uh, Daryl Keck is his name, have him sign. He, they spread more of it there than we do in Medina County. And I said, but you know what, you're up for re-election. What is this telling your constituents that you don't care about their health and welfare? And yeah, she's running for re-election. And another time when I testified and the gentleman who was um, the chair of the, the committee, he had the audacity to say to me, that I didn't respect them. And I said, no, sir, you all don't respect us, we the people, okay? We're trying to tell you what needs to be done, what we can do. You don't respect anything about us. So um, to that lady, yes, we have educated them. Education still gets continued, but you know, it goes nowhere with them and it's both sides. Like a lady told me today that signed the petition to stop gerrymandering. She goes, honey, are you for Trump? And I said, well, personally, I'm not happy with either side. I'm not going to give you a commitment because this is not what this is about. It's about gerrymandering. She goes, well, you know, those Democrats, they lie all the time. You need to vote for Trump. And I said, well, you don't think he lies? You don't think the Republicans lie? She goes, no, honey, they don't. She goes, maybe twice they did. Maybe twice they lied, but no more. And she goes, you really need to vote for Trump. And then she was on her way. So whatever. I just told you that it's a bit of humor. <laughs> Both only parties are corporate owned. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, Gwen. And I before you talk, it's almost seven. And the last conversations, we've gone about 15 minutes longer. So if you um, need to go, um, I'll be sending out, you know, a recording of this and for anyone that needs to go, thank you for coming tonight. But we're going to continue about another 15 or 20 minutes. Okay, Gwen. Um, I can remember, and I'm sure others can also, going down to Columbus to testify when the fracking in the parks was first brought up. And this entire, they, it, there were so many people testifying, <laughs> had to move to a larger room. And everybody testified against uh, fracking in the parks. And some of them represented organizations with hundreds and hundreds of members. And one, one person testified in favor. And that person later became the head of ODNR. Yeah. Just, just thought I'd let throw that in, but um just quickly i'm really in favor of uh finding people who think the way you do who live in your community and that requires talking about these issues and you're going to find some like the one that um, kathy just talked about but you're going to find others who say oh yeah Oh, I'm really glad to have talked to you about this. And then you can start talking about maybe starting a tree planting project or uh, some other project like that. So do something, but do it in community. Sandy. You're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I just like to go back to what Peter was saying with the del deluge, the 900 page. Personally, I'm not going to read that if it's got a bad ending. And I, I, I've read from other, like the Yes Magazine, how important it is to really envision what we want for the future. Oh. Instead of focusing on the negative, let's, okay. let's come up with the stories. What do we want? And you know, and focus on the the successes we have, and put it in a way that, you know, to try to create a more positive culture instead of focusing on all oh, this is doom and gloom. I think we need to focus on the successes. And I love what you were saying, Gwen. And I am going to start doing that in my community. I'm really concerned about all the industrialized farming. I'm hoping I didn't get poisoned yesterday because the farmer was out there spraying and didn't see me. And so I. <laughs> I was out there being exposed to who knows what, and I am going to contact the others in the area that are organic and see what we can do to expand 
that in our, our township and maybe the county. So thank you for inspiring me, Gwen. But I think we need to focus on what we, the positives, you know, and a positive vision for the future. Like that sign, <laughs> that Lake Erie sign. <laughs> Well, I don't know. Peter didn't say it. It had a bad ending. He just was, I don't know, did he? And I don't want him to spoil the ending because in case people who do want to read it, but it's like being prepared for what and how you're going to survive for things that, I mean, I think we're already witnessing. We're in the middle. It's yeah. not like it's coming anymore. It's like, you know, things are happening. Climate is changing right. things. So it's like, yeah, how are we going to, and I think strong community. So I think it's both of you. I think Sandy too, that same thing, right? That it's building that strong sustainable type community because then we can be resilient against some of these things because we'll have a, a base a strong you know community to rely on each other and, and i i'll jump in quickly not to spoil the ending but i appreciate your sentiments because i think uh creating positive stories and visions of what we uh want to uh, have in the way of community is so important yesterday i attended a session of the resilient activists about a book uh uh called Cassandra about what if women had more control of the stories we're telling. So I'll throw in a little controversy by saying I absolutely agree with that. I think we need different kinds of storytellers than the dominant patriarchy. Amen. <laughs> Did someone else have to? Oh, Heidi has her hand up. Hi, I'm hailing from Virginia, and um, uh, let's see, um, ever since we first became aware of Rights of Nature back in about 2017 um, and CELDEF's work, uh, we've been running as fast as we can to educate ourselves as best we can, and um, uh, and I, I feel like there's there's never any end to to learning, and some of the things that I'm um, uh, that I'm exploring now is really getting down to the roots of our discontent, which uh, I I first became aware of of the the idea of colonization um, through Seldef. Um, and then I, I started seeing it in numerous places, and I've been listening to uh, the Red Nation podcast for a number of years and hearing them talking about the settler colonial projects and, in, uh, you know, imperialism. And, and now that I have that background from an indigenous perspective, I, and I think most of us are pretty white on here. Um, <laughs> I don't know if there are any indigenous people on here, um, uh, but um, I, I have found it really helpful for framing my understanding of everything that goes on in the world, um, especially Palestine, um, because they they are a settler colonial um, a pr a project um, project of America of Britain, um, and. Uh, I, I, I wanted to um, maybe, uh, and then also um, the, the doctrine of discovery that really goes to the roots. Um, the I think she was a nun, the the Catholic woman yeah. who spoke. Yeah, she taught um, the the clip that you had of her talked about it if, as if it was in the past. But it very much, of course, influences everything. <laughs> it permeates all of our legal. Um, system today and all around the world, not just not just here. Um, and I'm there's a, a fabulous podcast. The folks up in Haudenosaunee country, up in um, uh, Syracuse University, there's a husband and wife couple who have a fabulous podcast called um, Mapping the Doctrine of Discovery. Which e e each podcast, I it just blows my mind. I keep learning more and more. Um, uh, and uh, another, um, like little thing that I wanted to say, um, is that here in Virginia, we were able to defeat the Atlantic coast pipeline. And as they say, um, you know, it's death by a thousand cuts. And one of the really significant, 
um, one of the many, and it's really an integral approach, you know, that's another way, uh, maybe a more positive way of saying it. Um, but one of the really positive things that happened, I don't know if you all know uh, Tom Perriello, who started Indivisible. He's from Virginia. He was a congressperson at the time of the pipeline, and he managed to get 16 progressives into Virginia. And it was thanks to those progressives, he got 16 progressives to run for office in Virginia. And thanks to those progressives, they had a huge impact on um, the progress of, of that pipeline. Um, so um, I, I wouldn't give up on our on on our electeds, uh, but they're not definitely, of course, not not the only way to go, uh, for sure. Um, there's many many approaches. One more thing I want to say because um, uh, we we um, we were able to defeat the Atlantic Coast Pipeline, and then right next on its heels was gold mining, um, and uh, um, and, uh, and and we've been able to resolve that um, somewhat. Um, but I, I also want to say that for me, I, I'm really um, searching for right. That's an eternal search, uh, right relationship. Um, but one of the things that I find really helpful is to, for me, is for the last four years, ever since George Floyd, um, a, a meditation group in Charlottesville started a, uh, a silent vigil outside the courthouse where over 30,000 souls were slowed, sold into slavery. And every week we have this silent vigil and we've questioned how long we're going to continue, but we, it, you know, it's indefinite. And we just, we, we feel like we, we elicit responses from people, even, you know, even though it's, it's not like it's a real crowded street, but it's just, it's a daily anchoring, sorry, weekly anchoring of being able to do something. <laughs> and I, I feel like that's really helpful is to have something to feel like you're, you're feeling useful, easeful, useful. Oh, and, that, and that's like a, a wake up call. I mean, sort of like the neon sign outside the Great Lakes Science Center it puts a little seed in there in, in people's brains, whether it's a question or a, um, yeah, what, what are they doing? And I, I wanted to make a comment that uh, the one, one of the amazing, wonderful things about the truth reckoning and right relationship events, and I was um, you know, lucky enough to go to both of them was the diversity um, on so many different levels. I mean, I was so excited to see young people and and it wasn't just uh, uh, people presenting and talking at you. It was it was active. You know, we created these own these communities within the larger uh, thing. And I, I just think it's a wonderful uh, model. And um, and I just applaud uh, Selda. So. It was it was really interesting. One of the things you reminded me of, Susie, was and and Russell thinking about you. It was so funny, even like trying to get people to define simple terms that we throw around all the time, like community, like define the word community, and then define like nature. Nobody could, no group could define nature. It was so funny after like all that time in there, but it was such a great, everybody had a lot of great conversations. So it's like not even that complicated and all that stuff helps form relationship with the people in your community. So you can then move on to something else. But yeah, we, we make things sometimes I think way too complicated. <laughs> I want to thank everybody who, you know, came tonight and started out because it's really important, I think, that we start, you know, having some of these conversations that we don't normally have. And because a lot of times it's about, yeah, going to the system, you know, and the more we go to the system, I know, Susie, I think you put that article in the chat about the MIN activist because I had to question. That. I did. Yeah. Yeah. Even the word activist, you know, like because people then rely on activists right in quotes to fix things right they're like another it's like instead of it's all of us <laughs> may i ask real quickly because in a um part of me for uh there was a woman there is a woman who is indigenous and she's a part she was a i think she was appointed the head of 
I want to say the parks, but I don't think it's the parks. Um, and she is the one who the Department makes... of the Interior is that who you're yes. thinking? Of? Deb yes. Holland. Yeah, Deb Holland. Mm -hmm. What's her name? Deb Holland. Deb Holland. Mm -hmm. And um, she recently put forth um, uh, some some kind of new directive where uh, to to go over again how um, organizations and such can get permits to do things on the lands, but she also opened up um, the ability for uh, permits to be conservatives of the land. Does this sound familiar to anybody? Do you know much anything about this? She it was a it was a tremendous piece of um, I guess she's been working on this. I don't know if it was legislation and if you uh, look at it or it got this very little blip of media attention and then just went right under the wire where uh, these same permits that you can to use minerals and things like that. You can also now get a permit um, to be a conservative. And, and again, I'm, it went so quickly and now I wanna go back and look it up uh, to be a conservator of the land. Um, and I thought it was an interesting way because there's already a lot of um, uh, indigenous groups that have that are now being um, asked for their help in how they manage the lands for so long. So, and they're working that into how the land is managed. And um, but now they can be permitted to do it. And I thought that was an interesting way of her using her position and politics to uh, legalize in some way, I don't know if I'm using the right terms, that uh, uh, um, um, getting permits. Uh, and I thought that kind of spoke to a, somewhat of the activism of the things we're talking about. But no, no, this does not sound familiar. You might want to look it up. She kind of, she, right. she slipped one in and it's tremendous. We'll see, we'll see what, what yeah. happens with it. Kim has her Kim has her hand up, and so can we like maybe make that sure. the last one? Is it seven fifteen? Yes. Thank you. So, um, what Maureen just shared reminded me of also Deb um, introducing something like a, a a truth and reconciliation commission on how the country, our country, was formed, and. I just, when I go to up to into Canada, just on the other side of our Lake Erie, our Great Lake Erie, and it's a completely different culture. Um, it's so close and it's completely different in terms of, of people living in right relationship with the land and with nature. And um, I think a lot of, a lot of that has to do with the, um, um, culture and, and indigenous populations there, everyone integrated into um, municipalities, into science, into education. Um, but I, I scratch my head thinking, how can it be so different? Um, but I think it comes to culture, as you were saying, Tish. Uh, and, and they, in, in Canada, they've had their Truth and Reconciliation Commission for um, almost 15 years, I think. And so just because this is kind of a law group, if I, I feel like that could be a powerful thing to really try to help push that forward here in the US. That's all. Thanks. Thanks, Kim. Great, well, again, thank you everyone for uh, being here tonight. Um, you will be receiving uh, the recording, it'll probably take me a couple days for, you know, YouTube and website and all that. Uh, but um, we have three other conversations. This was the fourth. And I did put in the um, chat our community conversation website um, page on the Ohio Community Rights Network. And just good to see y'all. Tish, any last words? <laughs> nope. Thanks everybody. And just keep, yeah, keep reading and sharing and learning and evolving just like, you know, the nature does, does and yeah. And yeah. 
And and be positive. Yeah, because I, I do think that's going to help. I mean, being negative isn't going to solve anything. It, keep, it keeps us at each other's throats, I guess, too, because it's like you're either for or against or you're with me or against me, that whole thing. And yeah, I mean, that's not going to help us. So thank you all. Thanks, everybody.